Thank you. Thank you all for coming on such a beautiful afternoon to this great cavern. And uh, I recognize some stalwarts who've been slogging through this all along, as well as some new faces. And so I'm just delighted you're here and we can go through this material together. Um, there is a discussion seminar tomorrow morning, uh, as usual, at 9 a.m. in the Ryle Room in the Radcliffe Humanities Building, and all are welcome. Please feel free to come. Uh, this motto, the, the motto for today is anonymous, and uh, it's the idea that myths are invented, but morality is discovered, that morality is actually a discovery that humanity has made, which has made it possible for us to become much of what we are. So that's part of what we're going to talk about. So let's just briefly review. Uh, a good theory should be descriptively adequate. It should fit the data, at least the parts of the data that seem reasonably uncontroversial, uh, reasonably well. Uh, it should promise, at any rate, to have explanatory adequacy. That is, it should offer some kind of a plausible explanation of the data in terms that are more or less systematic and that can integrate well with other well-confirmed theories. And it should help us make headway with problems that are independently seen as serious. You know, the theory shouldn't just generate its own problems. It should help us with problems we already identified. Sometimes that'll mean dissolving a problem by showing that it arises from a set of assumptions that it throws into questions and uh, to which it offers alternatives. So we'll do some of that today as well. Uh, let's remind ourselves also of the orthodox belief desire model of action. This uh, dead horse that everyone keeps flogging and that I somehow am trying to revive. Um, <clears throat> in this model, belief is representational, inert, has mind to world direction to fit, is capable of truth or falsity, and is cognitive and therefore potentially rational. Desire, by contrast, is non representational, motivating, has world to mind direction to fit, not capable of truth or falsity, and non cognitive. And therefore, with regard to rationality, it is uh, open for question what it might be. Uh, the interesting puzzle here is how it's possible for something that we would call rational action to come out of this, especially given that desire is what furnishes the goal for action and around which action therefore pivots. So uh, we tried to uh, somehow enrich this model, and part of what we tried to do was to see how it could be that states like desires and beliefs could come together to actually cause action, that they're not just sort of ballistic effects pushing action, but they can unite in a way to cause action. And uh, various attempts to do this in recent years have introduced the idea of the agent as somehow intervening uh, into uh, the agent's mental life. Problem with this model, as we saw early on, is that it launches a regress. We now have internal acts that need to be explained, and our theory that would explain them would have to be, again, the same theory. So uh, I'm suggesting that the problem may be that we just hadn't looked carefully enough at the nature of belief and desire to see whether if we focused enough on them and on their structure and nature, we could understand this process of creation of action uh, in those terms. And to do that, we assembled a bunch of field notes on desire and belief, and then used these to try to develop new models. Here are the models, these silly things I've been drawing for you throughout. Um, <clears throat> Desire at the top, belief at the bottom, in both uh, an effective attitude, a degree of liking or a degree of confidence toward a, an object via a representation, regulates and elicits a degree of focused motivation or focused reliance, which leads one to form expectations. These can be compared with the actual outcome of the action or the outcome of the expectation, and the feedback from that comparison then can be uh, used to adjust the degree of liking or the degree of confidence and also to uh, compete uh, among the other various claims on focused motivation and, uh, and uh, reliance. So that's the picture. It's a representational picture. It's a regulative picture. These are regulative states. And they're fundamentally action-guiding. It's part of their nature to be action-guiding and to operate in this way uh, uh, as a source of not only causes of action, but of a kind of structuring for action. Now, uh, what I have claimed is that these models can explain a number of otherwise puzzling features of desire and belief. First of all, why are they involuntary? What force keeps us from doing that? Well, effective attitudes are involuntary. Why belief and desire are projective, generalizing, content adding. No sooner does your child have its first taste of spinach than it announces that it hates spinach, and it generalizes this to all spinachdom. This is a powerful generalization, but you might say it's very well 
it's not very well warranted by the evidence, and the answer is desire doesn't work like that. Desire is projective and generalizing. It adds content. Um, but moreover, they provide weights that can generate and guide action, and these weights uh, somehow are self-tending. We looked at me crawling out on a branch to rescue a kite and noticed that my beliefs and my desires were spontaneously changed by hearing the crack of the branch underneath me, and that self-updating managed to reorient the whole psychology around this new bit of information without my carrying out any deliberation at all. We also saw that there are two kinds of strength in both desire and in belief, and that those two states are re represented or connected in such a way that there can be regulative and dysregulative functioning, and that can yield some of the miseries of belief and the miseries of desire that we suffer. And finally, it's a model that explains how other attitudes of an effective kind, emotions say, could enter on all fours with desire and belief and shape thought and action tendencies. We've all become convinced, uh, or most of us anyhow, that emotion has got this powerful role in putting us in touch with features of the world. How, though, does it enter into the shaping of action unless it can do so on some kind of common ground with belief and desire? Okay, so here's the revisionist model. Desire turns out to be representational, affect and act guiding. Uh, it has mind to world as well as world to mind direction of fit. Uh, it has a notion of accuracy of evaluative prediction and representation. It regulates motivation. And these are all features that enable us to say it's potentially rational. And therefore, we could have the picture that when desire and belief are rational themselves, they put us in a position to act rationally as well. Okay, and we did this in part by broadening the notion of mind to world direction of fit. It includes truth, of course, but it also includes things like aboutness or directedness. Where is the attitude directed? The accuracy of the attitude, the proportionality of it to the degree of evidence, the amount of evidence, whether the attitude represents some kind of an appropriate appreciation or understanding. We're going to talk more about those later today. Those are all forms of mind-to-world fit, and those are all forms that effective states can have apart from truth. And so in that sense, then, we get a picture of mind-to-world fittingness in which truth is a subcategory rather than the dominant category. Okay. Moreover, on this picture, uh, desire and belief are distinct uh, constitutionally and functionally. They play a different role in the guidance of action. One, one supplies motivation, the other one supplies reliance and expectation. Uh, the response to violations of belief are different from the response to violations of desire. So we're not trying to reduce desire to belief or belief to desire. We're not trying to create a new problematic category of desires or something like that. Uh, we're trying to introduce a way of thinking about these two categories, which would explain why they were both needed for action and why, for example, standard decision theory gives us the same kind of a picture of preferences and credences. Well, what are some more things we can do with this model now that we've got it up and running? Well, uh, one feature of belief and desire is, as Stalnecker writes, that they're correlative dispositional states of a potentially rational agent. To desire that P is to be disposed to act in ways that would tend to bring it about that P in a world in which one's beliefs, whatever they are, were true, and to believe that P is to be disposed to act in ways that would tend to satisfy one's desires, whatever they are, in a world in which P, together with one's others' beliefs, others beliefs were true. And so these, this picture of uh, belief and desire as dispositional states, it moves us away from a certain passive picture of disposition that we perhaps inherited from behaviorism. Now, there are very many difficulties with the notion of dispositions, but if Stalnecker is right, then potentially rational individuals are spontaneously disposed to act in these ways. They seek out opportunities to act, and they uh, can act without requiring some additional further mental action on the part of the agent. That is to say, they dispose us to act and not to be in a situation where acting could be a candidate. So we should see something like explicit self-conscious deliberation and decision as one of the things that we are disposed to do. It's among many things that we are disposed to do in response to features of the world. It's not something we need to add to beliefs and desires in order for our action to have potential rationality to be a response to reasons. Belief and desire just would not be doing their job in helping us to be rational and avoid regress if they did not in this way help us become skilled with reasons and reasoning. 
And an engineer looking at these states can say that they have the form of a tuning system. That is to say, they do guide the agent in a distinctive way, that is to say, minimizing certain kinds of error and expectation and allocating motivation in directions that are found to be satisfying. So this is a sense in which they are indeed dispositions to act in ways that are appropriate to our beliefs and desires. So uh, a puzzle for uh, me at any rate has been how to understand the notion of acting intentionally if that is not a matter of forming and following a self-conscious intention. And if, again, if we're going to avoid regress, including regress in forming intentions, it must be possible to act intentionally without such a self-conscious intention guiding the action. And the claim is that this dynamic and regulative model of desire and belief, it provides us an explanation of how acting intentionally could come about and it could have many of the distinguishing features of acting via an explicit intention, but minus the explicit intention. So let me just review those briefly. For example, when one is aing intentionally, aing is some act, uh, one is aing under an idea. That is to say, one has a representation of what one is doing. The representation presents A as having some desirability characteristic. That is the favorable effective attitude. That makes aing intelligible from the standpoint of the agent. The representation also gives a satisfaction condition for one's acting and orchestrates over time the deployment of attention, perception, memory, inference, motivation, and so on for the sake of this end. Belief and desire hold the end in view and regulate the individual's resources in such a way as to promote the realization of the end. And that's the sense in which behavior of this kind, intentional behavior, is teleologically organized. It's not just caused by belief and desire, it's organized toward the end with the end in view and in a way that tracks the need for realization, the needs for realization of the end. And that's the sense in which the organizing idea gives you an answer to the question, what are you doing, that renders the behavior intelligible. Now that answer is not always immediately accessible to us. Much of what we do intentionally, we do without conscious attention to what we're doing. We do it intentionally nonetheless. Uh, but when their behavior is brought to our attention, you know, did you realize that when you're walking across the room here, you're putting one foot in front of the other, I'll say, well, I hadn't thought about it, but yes, I was, and I, in, I did that intentionally. It wasn't an accident on my part. Uh, so that was what I was doing. I didn't have to have a conscious representation of it, but my system put that act together in a way such that it realized what I had in my mind, which was the need to demonstrate a concept in, in uh vivid terms for you here in front of the room. Uh, now, given the regulative role of the agent's representation of the idea, the learning dynamic of desire and belief shows us that there's a sense in which, as the theorists of action have told us, what renders the uh, act intelligible is also what guides the action. And this is a distinctive feature of action, namely that it is organized in a way that has a reasoned function rather than just the function of carrying out some or other causal sequence. Okay, there's a difference between behavior caused by one's beliefs and desires and action that is an intentional expression of them. And then we can use this model to do things like explain how we can intentionally deliberate, we can intentionally form intentions, we can decide to form an intention, we can decide not to form an intention, give up now and try later, those are all things we can do now intentionally, intelligently, under the idea that organizes them, but without launching a regress. Okay, so that then is the picture of how these functional states carry out this kind of intentional organization of behavior over time. This helps us, at any rate, uh, say something that might uh, cast some light on Aristotle. Um, Aristotle tells us that it is always the object of desire which produces movement, but this is either the good or the apparent good. So it's a feature of this account that movement is produced by an appearance of good of the object in some form, not necessarily moral good or good in any highfalutin sense, but good in the sense of an attraction. And that then makes it the case that it is the object and the representation of it that elicit the behavior, it produces the movement. The object of desire then is the starting point for practical intellect, and the final step is the starting point for action. Because these two states are states of belief and desire, 
when we have them together, we already have the starting of action. We have the organization, the motivation, and the expectation necessary to begin acting to have action underway. The origin of action, he writes, the efficient, not the final cause, is choice. And the origin of choice is appetition and purposive reasoning. Hence, choice is either repetitive intellect or intellectual appetition. And man is a principle of this kind. So uh, we can have a picture of this. Uh, suppose, for example, I have some representation of an end, which I have some positive theory of effective interest in. Uh, I can use my causal beliefs to generate from that representation a representation of a means and bring that same representation within the scope of that liking. And so what produces the action then will be a deliberated liking. It'll be a deliberated appetite, a deliberated desire via the causal model. And I will get the causal model from the very same place I get my other beliefs, namely by representations that I form in response to experience. So on this picture, then, action is deliberative appetition or appetitive deliberation. OK. Um, <clears throat> the view I presented is uh, what you might think as uh, congenial to epistemologists that operate in terms of degrees of belief. Um, but uh, as we saw earlier on, it has a place for outright belief as well. So for example, the prediction that is generated by belief is an outright prediction that can be then compared with an outcome for fit or failure of fit. So even as we're acting, we're not only acting on degrees of belief, but we're generating outright beliefs and outright expectations from which we learn. And so if you are a believer in full belief, if you have that picture of full belief, there is a way of understanding that kind of a picture of belief on this model. You can think that there is an underlying psychology which involves things like degrees of belief, but the conscious psychology, the psychology of our experience and our expectations, is a psychology of belief in the ordinary sense. Moreover, because the models through which we learn have this inherent tendency as regularizing models to generalize, to reach for more predictive relationships, it follows that, in a sense, we're doing something like inference to the best explanation. That is, when we receive experience, what we're attempting to do is build a model of the experience such that we could generate it. And what that does then is puts us in a position where the very character of perceptual belief and knowledge is the character of a process in which explanation is mediating the way in which we deal with perception. And indeed, we're looking for a compact, powerful, general explanation in that sense, then, you could have a full belief epistemology. You could be happy with that. You could think that we operate through inference to the best explanation and not find anything, I think, objectionable on this account. The kind of model-based understanding that I've referred to, do we have evidence of it? Well, we saw examples from intelligent animals, animals with foraging skills that have to make complex decisions involving trade-offs and multiple possibilities that they form models of space that are non-perspectival as well as perspectival, that those models are substantially independent of current stimulation. For example, they repeatedly activate such models in REM sleep. They do so when they're in a resting state. They do that simulation without need for external reinforcement. They can use that to get more information out of the experience that they had. And these same models play a role in action guidance. As we saw in our friend the rat at the choice point in the maze, the model is consulted prospectively in making a choice as to which uh, path to take in the maze. And in that sense, then, the model that is the explanation and the model that guides action, the practical model, are the same model. It's a unified picture in the evaluation of possible actions. Therefore, the dual role of models, not only in initiating action, but in generating expectations and setting us up for the kind of adjustment through experience that enables us to do something like a reaching motion or some more complex bit of behavior, uh, this enables us to see the model representation as what we could call a practical representation. Because it can guide action directly, it's the kind of model that the motor system needs in order to walk or in order to reach and grasp. 
it is a practical representation, even though it is in the form of a highly structured explanatory model. And in that sense, we can make, uh, give good meaning to the idea that in knowing how, in practical knowledge, we have a distinctive kind of practical representation. It is nonetheless informationally rich, it's powerful in generalizing, it's not muscle memory, uh, it's not merely embodied cognition, it's in that sense quite theoretical, but it can play this action guiding role and therefore be a practical mode of presentation. A distinguishing feature of this account is that affect plays such a central role. Why would that be? Why would affect have a central role in desire and in belief and in, then in intentional action? Well, affect is uh, the uh, brain's common currency for valuation. The various different species of affect, aroused versus default, species like fear versus confidence, surprise versus assurance, anger versus affection, disappointment versus satisfaction, these all correspond to different dimensions of information and value that are important to the individual for the regulation of thought and action if they're going to behave in an intelligent social way. They need these kinds of information and they need to keep this kind of information straight while at the same time permitting it to be in a common economy which will then contribute to the decision weights it needs to guide action. And so a, 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 a standard view now about the affective system is that it permits this kind of a common currency of evaluation within the mind. And therefore, we should expect that desire and belief, because they are having this pivotal role in regulating action, we should expect that they would have affect at their center as well. Moreover, as we argued from uh, the first two lectures, the affective character of these responses is itself apt for creatures like us who can be conscious. Affective states deliver a phenomenology for the appreciation of value. Fear is a very effective way of appreciating danger. Trust is a way of uh, phenomenologically responding to reliability and loyalty. Uh, someone who is incapable of fear in a certain sense, does not know danger in the way that someone capable of fear does. And for this reason, Aristotle thinks that the virtuous, courageous person is going to know fear because it will acquaint him, give him knowledge or her knowledge of fear in proportion to its actual presence in the world. Similarly, for the way that trust is going to found uh, the kinds of relationships among people that make it possible for us to rely on each other, understand each other, and have the kind of dependence upon each other that we need to have. So uh, this is a picture of uh, an example of a region involved in affect. This is in this case the amygdala, which is involved in a number of kinds of affect. Uh, and the point of the illustration is to show you that it has very direct connections with a huge variety of areas in the brain. Uh, only a very few are not connected. And so as a common currency, as a way in which you're going to try to get some kind of a comparison of the different elements of information you need for thought and action, uh, this is the kind of state that you should expect to represent it. Now, uh, we also saw evidence that uh, recording, direct recording from individual neurons uh, in the effective system represents magnitudes of uncertainty and value it segregates these magnitudes. It also computes what looks like expected value. And these expected value calculations predict the animal's behavior. So we have very direct evidence that something like this kind of common currency evaluation is going on in the brain. We can't do this kind of work on humans directly. But insofar as we can measure human cognition in this regard, we find that the same areas are active. These are areas that are evolutionarily highly conserved. Moreover, here's another Aristotelian thought for us tonight. Um, affect enters early into the visual stream to provide a way of assessing information rapidly in a way that could be relevant to subsequent action or cognition. So we remember this diagram. It shows input from the visual taste, olfaction, and touch system coming in 
very few synaptic connections and we're interacting with the reward and effective system there in the middle. Uh, this system then projects to uh, decision making and uh, higher order cognition and the thought is that if you're going to have a system that encodes these fundamental behavior and thought guiding values, you should be using it perceptually. You should take advantage of the information encoded there in understanding your perceptual experience. And that is indeed what seems to happen. So uh, for those who like the idea, and I do, uh, this gives us a picture of you could, how you could actually have evaluative perception. Evaluative perception doesn't require some special faculty of detecting value. What it requires is an encoding of perception by affect in such a way that what we perceive, what is presented to us, is already encoded with value. Um, evaluative perception, Aristotle argues, is central to our practical understanding, how we can engage with particular situations and actions. Of the, of the role of particulars in practical intellect, he writes, these are matters of perception. Why? Well, if we were to keep on deliberating at each stage, we shall go on without end. So perception is able to stop the regress of deliberation by delivering us this kind of evaluative information directly. We must therefore have a perception of the particulars, and this perception is understanding. <clears throat> Aristotle writes that these states do indeed have a dynamic of learning over time. These states, these perceptual understandings, actually seem to grow naturally so that people seem to have natural consideration, comprehension, and judgment as their experience extends. And moreover, such consideration, comprehension, and judgment as they grow with age mean that we should attend to the undemonstrated remarks and beliefs of the experienced and older. This is always good for someone like me to hear. Uh, the undemonstrated remarks of such older people as myself or of prudent people, I'm not sure I qualify there, uh, no less than to demonstrations. For these people see correctly because experience has given them the eye. Well, how could experience give you an eye for something as complicated as value? The answer would be because the eye is part of a system that is designed to deliver evaluative perception to you and to learn evaluative information from your experience so that you have undemonstrated evaluative knowledge. Now I'm going to bring you to something that John Broom uh, discovered and pointed out to me. This is a, a printed text of uh, a, a very old document. I guess the original document is from 1250 or something like that. And it's a set of rules that were written for uh, uh, women who are going to be members of a religious order. And uh, it is, John found, uh, as, as far as he could tell, the first occurrence of the word reason in uh, anything like the modern sense that we have right now. That is to say, reasons being used in this way uh, for the guidance of action. And what's intriguing about that, in, at least from my standpoint, is that the context in which it's introduced is explained reason, that is, wits skill. That is, skill with your wits, skill with thought. And so the picture then of reason as a skill as a capacity for thought, as a capacity for using thought in an effective way, uh, goes back to the earlier appear earliest appearances of the word reason in English. So you might ask, well, what would this wits skill look like? Well, it would look like and be of a piece with other context and goal-sensitive skills. Uh, skills of this kind, we have reason to believe, are based upon models, and so wits skill should be as well. At least since Aristotle, it's been clear that there must be forms of non-deliberative responsiveness to reasons, forms of responsiveness that put us in touch with reasons, but not via demonstration. And at least since Aristotle, it's been common to call such non-deliberative capacities intuition, partly on the model of how perception puts us in touch with reasons. But in addition to intuition, philosophers have spoken more broadly of understanding which constitutes not only perception, but knowledge. Knowledge represented in forms that can be capable of non-deliberatively guiding thought and action. That's the idea we mentioned earlier of a practical mode of representation. So I want you to just think right now of what a complex body of largely tacit information 
and generalizations constitutes your understanding of your native language. It's not only an understanding of the language, it's an understanding of how you use the language, uh, principles and norms of conversational context, the ways in which you use the language spontaneously to express your thoughts. All of this complex body of largely tacit knowledge, think of that then as language skill, uh, in the same way that we might have wit skill or we might have skill in any other area. That's your language skill. Similarly, you could think about our largely implicit understanding of the physical and social dynamics that we interact with daily. Those are our skill with negotiating the physical and the social world around us. Both of them require these heavyweight bodies of tacit knowledge in a form such that it can be regulative of thought and action. And on the present account, then, this is the role of these causal evaluative models. These appear to play a direct role in skilled action as we understand it and to explain how action that is skilled can be flexible in response to changing circumstances. It's a characteristic of skilled action, unlike action that's merely habitual or action that is highly conditioned or overtrained. Skilled action shows flexibility right up to the very last moment. And this is how, for example, skilled speakers come up with just the right word, skilled athletes come up with just the right movement and get the drop on less skilled athletes because they have this capacity to be alive to these considerations through their capacity to model possibilities. Okay, now we asked last time, can this picture of wit's skill, can it help us explain moral intuition and understanding and maybe give us the beginnings of an answer to questions about the potential epistemic status of moral intuition and understanding. It's been an embarrassment to moral philosophy for some time that we've lacked a good theory of the epistemic status of intuition, where it might come from, why it might have authority, what kind of understanding it might or might not represent. And this has left moral philosophy very vulnerable to these challenges we discussed last time. Uh, the challenges, for example, that came from uh, psychologists arguing that intuition, moral intuition, was the product of relatively primitive effective responses, ignorant of statistics, ignorant of relations of uh, content and dependency, made philosophy, uh, moral philosophy very vulnerable to evolutionary critiques of intuition. Why would we expect evolution to produce something like moral intuitions? In order to have a response then, philosophy has to elaborate a picture of how moral intuition could work and do its job. Now, you've seen this before, right? This is when I'm about to launch off in one of my uh, forays, uh, un unlicensed forays into uh, psychology. Um, <clears throat> it's um, warning this time, though, is a different one, that uh, what I'm about to show you is not psychology. And this is, of course, the sampling that I've been doing in my classes, which is a completely uncontrolled experiment doesn't meet ordinary standards, and I mention it here, I present it here just as a way of trying to suggest how it is we might look at these. And what we did last time was we looked at an array of intuitive responses in some familiar and unfamiliar moral dilemmas, as well as a series of related questions about moral understanding, how people understood the situations morally. That's the kind of thing you can ask in a classroom when you don't have to meet standards of human subjects research. So we compared the predictive and explanatory value of, for example, the contemporary dual process models of moral intuition, which have been used as a critique of the epistemic status of moral intuition. Um, and we compared these with what was a model-based approach involving the idea that moral intuition is actually grounded in a kind of simulation and evaluation of possible acts, agents, structures, and feelings. And my claim was we got a better fit on the model-based account than on the account based on rapid, uh, relatively primitive, uh, affective responses as opposed to uh, cost-benefit uh, responses. Okay, so what was an example? Uh, this was a, the familiar case of switch with trolleys. Uh, should you throw the switch to send the trolley on a sidetrack? We then asked the question, would you trust your roommate or a friend more the lesser same if he or she had thrown the switch in such an example, in such a case? 
And as you'll see, the answer was that it had a very neutral effect on trust, neither increasing or much uh, diminishing trust. Um, similarly with Loop, which uh, garners a high level of support from my undergraduates, uh, but again uh, has a relatively neutral effect on trust, maybe a little bit of a gain. Um, and remember the example of wave. This was the example where you waved to the workers down the track and five of them stepped off the track and one of them stepped on. Uh, this attracted a relatively high degree of acceptance, 87% thought you should wave. And if we look at the profile of what sort of trust they would feel in the aftermath of learning that a friend had waved in such a situation, again, we got this familiar pattern. So these cases are remarkably similar in this pattern of trust attribution. Okay, what happens then if we look at uh, cases like Footbridge? Okay, in Footbridge, of course, famously, people think we, uh, uh, a majority of people think we should not push. And if we ask, would you find yourself with more, the same or less trust of a friend or roommate who had pushed in a Footbridge situation, the answer is shifted very strongly toward less trust and even people who thought you should push did not think this made you a more reliable individual. What about Beckon? That was the other example we considered. It didn't involve any kind of laying of hands on someone, pushing someone to a gory death. It was a simple hand gesture. Uh, but again, it was widely disapproved um, by my undergraduates. And if we ask about their trust response as well, we get a very similar pattern. And so the suggestion I was making was that when people model these situations, when the philosopher gives them the scenario, they try to model the situation, what's at stake, they model the agent, they ask what kind of an agent would be able to perform this action, uh, what kind of, would I trust an agent like that, how much would it, uh, the uh, agent's willingness to perform an action like that affect how I evaluate the agent, and that that's mediating these judgments and resulting in the pattern that we saw between Footbridge and Beckon on the one hand, and loop and trust and wave on the other. And then, uh, so this was the, the overall comparison. And uh, we also looked at this new example of bus uh, in which you do lay hands on someone, you do cause a gory death, but uh, my undergraduates uh, overall tended to approve of this action. And the result was strikingly different with regard to trust than in the case of, let's say, Footbridge, where you similarly lay hands on someone to cause a gory death. In this case, trust was increased. So the question was, could we understand these judgments as mediated by this kind of a characterological assessment? Uh, well, another question you can ask is, maybe the students just have very poor judgment about character. Maybe they don't understand how it is that moral action occurs. Uh, so we look then at the psychology that has studied the uh, populations that give these various different verdicts. And what we found was that there is a correlation between disposition to give a push verdict in Footbridge-like scenarios with rating on a psychopathy scale, egoism, general disregard for moral violations. It's not highly correlated with altruism or utilitarian sentiment. Um, it's also correlated with decreased levels of empathy and harm aversion, lessened perspective taking. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you get a greater response when you lower people's inhibition. And um, others have found that there seems to be an underlying model of the agent that's involved in these judgments. And so the empirical psychology, insofar as it's been developed, seems to fit this picture that the students are onto something real, they're making reasonable evaluations of agents who could perform these actions, and that that's shaping their judgments. Similarly, we looked at students' reactive attitudes. We gave them scenarios where they would be approaching the family of the person whom they had caused to die. Would you feel regretful, sympathetic, but with reasonable hope they'd understand? Would you feel regretful, guilty, and sympathetic with some hope they'd understand? Would you feel regretful, ashamed, and sympathetic with little hope? And what we found is that in uh, the case of Switch, uh, the majority felt they would be regretful, guilty, and sympathetic with some hope of being understood. Uh, indeed, a fairly substantial number thought that they could expect a sympathetic response, whereas in the Footbridge case, again, the reactive attitudes follow the same pattern, and the strongest response is then not just guilt, but shame. That is to say, failure to live up to 
reasonable social expectations. And so, descriptively and explanatorily then, the model-based account seemed to give us a way of describing these patterns of judgment. Um, is there independent reason to think that there is general model-based capacity at work in these moral judgments? Once again, a warning here. This is your daily phrenology alert. Um, again, looking at a connectomic view of the mind, what we found was that in the default network, which is a primary mode of operation of the brain, that's the mode that we operate in when we're at rest or when we are uh, off a, a task, we switch between the default mode and the task mode regularly in our daily lives. What does this mode do? Autobiographical memory, for example, envisioning the future, theory of mind, and uh, moral decision making. So uh, again, this is just phrenological evidence, or a little bit better, because connectomics is a little better developed than phrenology. Um, but it's evidence that independent of what, the, what we came up with in our, my little kitchen chemistry, that there's evidence that something like modeling, theory of mind, representing the minds of others, envisioning future possibilities, and drawing upon autobiographical memory to fill in the scenarios, that this is indeed what's going on in moral judgment. And so the picture that comes out is a sort of more unified picture in which uh, there is a fundamental mode of operation in the brain which is continuously simulating possibilities. It's putting us in a position to have responses ready when, for example, circumstances change and we have to adapt. And uh, such a simulation uh, gives us a way of understanding Aristotle's idea that uh, the virtuous person needs a tremendous amount of experience. They must actually perform the virtuous action, but they also will show their excellence most clearly in cases where they can act without deliberation. How could that be? Well, if moral behavior were just habitual, that would seem to explain it. But we've seen that moral behavior is more complicated, its underlying features are more model-based, and so what would this be? This would be the idea of imaginative rehearsal, that virtuous individuals, when they have experiences, not only have the experience that they're having directly, but they imaginatively rehearse alternatives. And as a result of that, they develop responses that can be prepared for a wider range of situations. And they do that spontaneously in such a manner that their behavior can be self-expressive. Okay, so again, it's not habit. It's not something that would be characterized as a reflex. It's something that is a capacity, a skill in using your wits. Okay. Well, let's talk about some evolutionary concerns now and the development of moral skill. Some evolutionary psychologists and some evolution-inspired philosophers have been arguing that we really shouldn't expect humans, the product of natural selection, to be equipped with a capacity to track morally relevant considerations in their own right. Weren't our psychological capacities selected for success in reproduction and replication of genetic material? How could capacities selected under those conditions have the characteristics needed for something like moral responsiveness, which is after all supposed to be impartial, it's supposed to be general, it's supposed to be concerned with others intrinsically, and it's supposed to have a capacity to motivate even in cases where one sees no contingent advantage. So, um, first a word from anthropology. If we look at the longest period of human uh, evolution and look at the anthropological studies as best we can, uh, it would appear that uh, the longest period of human evolution was spent in relatively egalitarian societies, societies with a high degree of sharing, in which the sharing was not dictated by a social hierarchy, uh, in which those who did the best in hunting, for example, were not necessarily accorded a larger share, where people at different stages in their life were accorded a share in accord with their needs. And so these societies, these highly egalitarian, highly sharing societies, they had a capacity through self-enforcement of norms to regulate themselves in a manner that does not look at all like the idea of uh, competitive hierarchical self-interest. So whatever evolutionary equipment we have, it has to be equipment that made it possible for us to interact in this way. Such groups, moreover, 
often had ex relations with other groups. People often moved from one group to another. Often there was ex-marriage ex ex where the individuals in one group would marry individuals in another group and relocate. So uh, they, they weren't just uh, us versus them. They weren't just small bands against the world. They were human communities like our human communities with uh, elaborate norms, with extensive sharing, and with a capacity to incorporate new members and do so uh, in a way that made those new members full members of the community. So that's a word from anthropology suggesting that we shouldn't look at the evolutionary record as nature read in tooth and claw. But anyhow, these claims, these evolutionary claims are completely highly speculative. Uh, we should not rely heavily upon them, and it'd be much better for us to look more directly at the capacities that humans display in their own lives. And the, uh, a way of doing this is to try to look at human development. If we try to look at the development of human social attitudes, what do we see? And it's important for this discussion, if we're going to have the idea that human attitudes are sensitive to moral considerations, that we recognize that being sensitive to moral considerations is not the same thing as having moral concepts. Thus, a very young child could be sensitive to moral considerations, considerations of sharing or fairness, for example, without having the concept of sharing or fairness, so long as that consideration played the right kind of role in their thought and behavior. So what do we see when we look at human psychology developmentally? Well, we saw in looking at our friend the rat that they generate not only perspectival but non-perspectival representations of physical space. Animals also do some non-perspectival social mapping. For example, highly social animals like chimpanzees actually spend a lot of time watching each other and forming notions about which individuals are more cooperative, which ones are more dangerous, which ones would make a better partner. And so in that sense, our ancestors, our highly intelligent primate ancestors, were modeling their social situation not just with regard to their own current interests or needs, but with regard to the kinds of behaviors they were seeing in the others around them. Now, that same kind of capacity can be developed and redeployed in humans. So let's just take a look at the developmental literature. First, I want to make a case that humans engage in what I'm going to call non-perspectival epistemic mapping. That uh, infants, in their very first months, use passive observations of the environment to form accurate expectations of, of statistics, visual statistics, phonetic sequences. By 12 months, they reliably distinguish between unable and unwilling behavior in adults, even though these are third-party interactions. By 16 months, they show heightened attention to mistaken labeling and use of words and pay more attention to those whose use of words is more reliable. Uh, Within the period of the first 36 to 48 months, they've used third-person behavior to discriminate the accuracy, knowledgeability, competence, reliability, deceptiveness, and quality of will of the adults around them. And they use that information in determining their own behavior, that is, who to learn from, who to cooperate with, who to help. So that infants, in that sense, aren't simply dependent upon what they've been told. They aren't simply dependent upon those who've had personal relations with them. They're forming their own non-perspectival representation of the social space around them and its possibilities. What's the foundation of that capacity? Well, we talked early on about the role that some kind of trust has to play. An infant that didn't have any trust in its perceptual capacities or its mental faculties could never acquire evidence as to whether those faculties are trustworthy. And so therefore, there must be a kind of a prior, a kind of default trust that infants have toward their senses, toward their faculties, and toward others if they're going to learn from them. This kind of capacity, this default trust, is defeasible, and it's actually the foundation for a kind of autonomy. Because what it means is that infants will form their own ideas about the adults or the others around them, and they will be willing to rely upon those ideas even when they're being tolding, told otherwise. So, for example, infants at a certain age will begin to notice that their parents aren't the greatest experts in the world that their parents are often wrong about things, and they will hunt around to look for adults who are more reliable in those respects and pay more attention to the 
uh, suggestions or the behavior of those more reliable adults. And they can do that because they're not just relying upon what they're told about whom to believe and whom not to believe. What about their moral environment? Well, here there's a very interesting series of experiments, which many of you are aware of by Kylie Hamblin, using these puppets. People know this work. Very early infants are shown puppet shows in which one kind of a puppet, like a triangle puppet, is trying to get up a little hill, and another kind of a puppet, let's say a square puppet, comes along and pushes the triangle back down the hill, or a circle puppet comes along and helps push the triangle up the hill. So the infants watch this with great interest, and then when they're given a chance, they choose to play with the helper puppet rather than the hinderer puppet. <clears throat> By eight months, they've even learned to play or to prefer a puppet that hinders a hinderer over a puppet that helps a hinderer. Now, uh, we don't want to rely too heavily upon any given body of experiments, but what's striking about these experiments is how, from the infant's perspective, it makes perfectly good sense. It's trying very hard, it's reasonably helpless individual, it's trying very hard to figure out helpfulness and non-helpfulness in the environment around us. It's trying to understand the behavior of others in terms of that capacity to help or not to help. It does so in a way that doesn't have immediate reference to its own uh, interests. Indeed, it expresses satisfaction when it sees the triangle puppet pushed up over the hill and uh, succeeding in going down the other side. So the, the puppet's actively engaged, the, the child's actively engaged in these uh, morality plays and therefore actively engaged in this kind of uh, sampling. Uh, Hume argued that a capacity for sympathy and empathic simulation was just a fundamental part of our motivational structure and our ability to understand each other. Do we see evidence of this kind of empathy? Well, even in the first year of life, infants have shifted, many of them, most of them, from empathy as mere emotional contagion, something like picking up the emotions around them, to uh, what's called empathic concern, that is to say, f reacting in a way that demonstrates concern for the empathic state of the other. By nine to 10 months, infants show signs of spontaneously trying to help those in distress. As their physical abilities grow, so do their attempts to uh, comfort those in distress or to assist them. And so if you ever want to have a heartwarming experience, I encourage you to look at some of these films about infants' spontaneous helping behavior without the uh, admonition of uh, any adult. An experimenter knocks a pencil off a table and reaches like that. And uh, even little infants who crawl, they'll crawl over and try to get to the pencil to try to help the poor experimenter. Moreover, by that age, they will notice how much the person's trying to get to the pencil in order to modulate their own activity. So by 12 to 16 months, infants engage in attempts to assist those in distress without external reinforcement, without reward. So this seems to be an autonomous capacity on the part of children. They aren't told to do this. They nonetheless do it, and they do it relatively spontaneously. Therefore, uh, you could think that empathic concern functions to make them sensitive to these kinds of morally relevant features of third-party interactions, when people need help, when people are harming or hindering one another. Recently, people have looked at infant responses to sharing behavior, to whether they notice in a given joint activity, whether the uh, result of that activity is shared equally among the individuals involved. They respond differentially to what we could conceive of as unfair divisions in which the action is joint, but one receives more reward than the other. Moreover, they will spontaneously make efforts to try to correct the distribution. And so in that sense, they're monitoring not only empathically, but with a concern for something like fairness. Where would this come from? Again, we have to posit that there are some default attitudes just as the infant needs default trust in order to learn epistemically, the infant must have some measure of default trust toward others in order to rely upon them, in order to acquire the kind of moral knowledge that's going to be needed. So you can think that infants start off with a default but defeasible pro-social prior. They initiate uh, attempts to help. They care about whether, infants, whether uh, other infants are in distress. They notice whether the goals around them are being helped or hindered by those uh, who are near them. 
And so uh, this kind of a prior could be a prior that would enable them to code the situation positively when you have positive sum human interactions, and that could be, in a sense, a kind of proto-moral sensitivity even before moral concepts are developed. This has, again, the effect, as in epistemology, of getting a kind of autonomy for the individual. These individuals who we've been discussing, some of them are pre-linguistic. They have not been given extensive moral instruction, and yet they're showing the kind of behavior that moral instruction might give them as a model. Well, uh, if the behavior is not instructed, if it's not being reinforced, where is it coming from? And one answer would be it's coming from these models that the infants construct of their environment and that give them a certain degree of autonomy. And I think the most striking example of this is that by age three or four, uh, infants show an understanding or an appreciation of the distinction between moral and conventional violations. I don't know if you know this research. It's done by Curiel and Smetna and others. Um, a substitute teacher comes into the classroom, says to the students, uh, okay, students, uh, I'm your substitute teacher today. I have my own rules. The rule for today is if you want to speak in class, you have to raise your hand. And children by that age have enough skill with norms to be able to say, okay, I'll raise my hand uh, today, uh, even though that's not our normal practice. If the teacher instead says, Okay, class, uh, if you want to speak, this is my classroom, here's my rule. You have to jab a pencil into the arm of the student next to you uh, in order to speak. Uh, infants won't do this. They'll refuse to comply. Why? Uh, ask them and they'll explain it in terms of the harm that would be uh, inflicted by this pencil poking or whatever. And so what they're doing is showing a kind of autonomy. Here's a conventional figure capable of legislating for that environment in the usual sense. They're rejecting this, and they're doing it on grounds that are sensitive to morally relevant considerations. Okay. And um, <clears throat> you might finally ask, yes, they're modeling something, but are they modeling moral information? Is that what's going on in these cases? So let me just try talking through the epistemic case first. So we believe, generally, that individuals can be responsive to reasons, epistemic reasons, without deploying epistemic concepts. Even very young infants can be responsive to evidence. The question is, do they represent evidentially or epistemically relevant information for what it is? Does that representation of this information encode an understanding of it and its relevance? And do these representations orient thought and action, including things like behavior, in ways that are appropriate to the epistemic relevance? And so if we can find these features, we can say that the infant is responding to epistemically relevant features in a way that is appropriate as an apt response. Well, in a similar way, in the moral case, we don't require that the infants have moral concepts in order to do this. Do they represent morally relevant information in its own right? Well, that's what empathy does. It represents the distress or the need or the harm or the helping of the other. Does that representation encode an understanding of its nature? Yes, it encodes harm as negative. It encodes helping as positive. It encodes comforting as positive, distress as negative. Do those representations orient their thought and action, including evaluation and motivation insofar as they express this, in ways that are appropriate to the features moral relevance, and again, the answer seems to be yes. So, that's a claim. My claim is we have evidence for thinking without necessarily going deeply into the evolutionary history of the human psyche. We have evidence for thinking that infants are already on their way toward forming non-perspectival, general, consistent thought and action guiding models of the morally relevant features of their situation, they're doing this independent of authority or sanction, that they're concerned with harms and benefits and fair sharing, and that they're doing so in a relatively autonomous way. And so that would be, for me, an example of Witzskilla. It's a, an example of humans learning to be moral agents in the world from their experience, responding to morally relevant considerations in morally relevant ways. Okay. Well, um, 
Let me now uh, say just a brief word about the normative relevance of any of this. Um, if this is right, uh, then the evidence that we've seen suggests that at least we should have a cautious attitude toward these debunking evolutionary accounts. Uh, there doesn't seem to be strong ground for thinking that evolution did not equip us for moral behavior. Moreover, we should be suspicious of the very strong debunking dual process arguments because we've seen evidence that there are processes that are not based upon uh, push-button moral reactions or that are not illogical and that could underlie the same patterns of moral judgment and indeed explain others as well. Now, all of this might be enough to make you think that uh, perhaps uh, Aristotle and Hume are right, that our moral evaluation is focused on the person. It's focused on our understanding of the person, what kind of behavior a person would be willing to engage in. And in that sense, then, there's a mediation of our moral responses by an assessment of the agent. And so um, if we ask, for example, in the case of switch and wave, about the imaginative proximity of the potential workers, uh, what we'll see that in both cases, all six are the most proximate. If we look at the case of Footbridge and Beckon, the individual who's going to be harmed is most proximate. Well, what might this tell us about their moral competency? Suppose they're looking at this situation. Uh, over here, they're looking at Footbridge. If they have this kind of moral competency, if we have this moral competency, if my students have it, then when they look at the situation of Footbridge, what they see is not only a benefit, that is to say the, the individuals who are saved, but they see a striking difficulty of being the person who's up on the footbridge and is supposed to push. That's what this uh, indicates. Similarly, in the case of Beckon. So it is part of their appreciation of the situation that they have this distinguished focus. So I'm not claiming that any one of these perspectives is correct. I'm claiming that these perspectives yield morally relevant information. Okay, well, let me now uh, push on to uh, the importance of explicit deliberation uh, before finally coming to some meta-ethical conclusions. <clears throat> in order to be able to respond to reasons in ways that animals cannot, it's not because we represent options and ends abstractly or we consider choices prospectively or we look at alternatives and weigh their advantages or disadvantages, or that we follow a good, to a good approximation norms of rationality in revising our expectations and choices. Animals, it turns out, highly intelligent animals can do all of this and more. They can explore the world and its prospects mentally as well as physically, and they can choose in light of a weighing of competing goals. So if this isn't the way in which we are superior to animals, or the way we are different to animals, what is? And I'm going to claim that what's distinctive of humans is a capacity to do more than this kind of probabilistic modeling. To, for example, introduce new concepts and practices, to have inheritance of innovations through explicit instruction, culture, and systematic development of more accurate and reliable forms of assessment that permit us to cooperate on an unprecedented scale in other words, the fundamental moral equipment that we may have is equipment, a lot of which is going to be shared by our animal ancestors. What we have added is a distinguished capability to use uh, our wits skilla for self-conscious deliberation, for self-conscious introduction of rules, methods, norms, and procedures, for self-conscious instruction in the culture, and that's the sense in which humans are capable of the extreme degrees of sociability that we find. Not just small bands roaming around in a reasonably cooperative way, but large-scale societies where people will sit and listen to lectures, where they will uh, spend uh, time and effort and money to go to a university or teach at a university, um, where they can depend upon others to be out there carrying on their jobs at the same time. Uh, for all of this to be possible, it must be possible for us to have more than just an intuitive understanding of each other or an intuitive understanding of each other's dispositions, personality, likely behavior. We need to have standardized measures, shared rules, 
norms and principles of justice. And that is a distinctive feature of, it seems, human conduct made possible perhaps by language, which is again an example of something similar to this. So we would have no hope of having a wits skilla for handling these large scale human organizations or complex decisions about future generations or international justice or whatever, if we didn't have this capacity to formulate and act on these explicit rules. Does that mean that rules are the thing that distinguish the human moral sensibility? Well, remember the three families of normative concepts. Logic, rules, metrics, laws, and so on belong to the family of regulatives, the family of the norma, of the rule, of the, the uh, measuring instruments, the idea of a straight or correct answer. These don't themselves tell us what to do with our lives. If we are to use them evaluatively to achieve some kind of valuable goal, to improve our deliberative capacity, then we're going to need more than just these regulative capacities. They won't stand at the top of our moral competency. What we saw in the case of explicit rule following discussing uh, Wittgenstein was that we could have an intelligent disposition to use a rule that was not itself based upon a rule. And that intelligent disposition is the kind of disposition that the children show when they reject the substitute teacher's new rule. That is to say, they're alive to the moral cost of the new rule, and they're disposed not to follow it. OK. Finally, where does any of this leave us meta-ethically? And I just want to give a few final thoughts here. Motivational judgment internalists about moral judgment say that there's a necessary conceptual connection between judging that something is, say, morally right or morally good and being to some degree motivated favorably toward it. This has been a central dynamic within metaethics since the beginning of the 20th century. This idea is thought to capture the notion that an agent's moral judgments must have practical force for the agent. And non-cognitivists and expressivists have considered it a decisive advantage for their view that they can capture this kind of an internal connection between moral judgment and motivation since they hold that the state of mind expressed in moral judgments is a motivating state, but also, therefore, not a mere belief. Uh, for example, in Ruling Passions, Simon Blackburn argues that 18th century philosophy of mind got it right in dividing the mind into Apollonian and Dionysian states. The Dionysian states are passionate. They include emotions, passions, arousals, and so on, desires, impulses, whims, and lusts. The, it sounds like fun. The Apollonian states include attitudes and stances, knowledge, uh, truth, and reasons. And the thought is that insofar as morality purports to be a form of knowledge, truth, or rational activity, it would have to depend upon the Apollonian. But if morality is going to be practical, if it's going to be action guiding, the claim is it has to be grounded instead in the Dionysian. And so he writes, there's an inseparable, insuperable obstacle to keeping ethics under the rule of Apollo. Suppose we think our ethics is entirely exhausted by our beliefs. What then? Even the most magnetic star does not attract everyone. Beliefs do not normally explain actions. In addition, it takes a desire, a concern, a caring for whatever the belief describes. This practical role is what ethics is for. If there is such a thing as ethical knowledge, it is a matter of knowing how to act, when to withdraw, whom to admire, more than knowing that anything is the case. We have seen, however, that affective states can, by their nature, be both motivating and have mind-to-world mind -to -world direction of fit, just like beliefs. Affective states represent the world in certain ways and constitute, therefore, a form of cognizing it. If you think of fear as a paradigm, it presents the world as possessing certain threats or risks, it could be more or less accurate, more or less well-directed, more or less reasons responsive, and so on. And so fear does indeed help us to know how to act, when to withdraw, as, as Blackburn would put it. It's a practical attitude. But at the same time, it's a knowing attitude. Fear is an attitude that helps us know danger and take its measure and represent it accurately and give it the right role in our conduct. Affective states then typically, although they come in degrees and can't be spoken of as true or false, they can have, as we said earlier, mind-to-world fittingness in terms of directedness, accuracy, proportionality, and finally, appreciation and understanding, because effective states can deliver an understanding, as fear gives us an appreciation 
of risk. So, finally then, it seems to be unwarranted to conclude that moral knowledge is not possible from the fact that moral judgment has practical force. Moral knowledge is a matter of, a matter of accurate, well-directed, proportional understanding and appreciation of moral considerations. We've seen how it is that the belief and desire system can afford us the wherewithal for such understanding and appreciation. Motivation alone was always a poor proxy for the practical force of moral judgment. Simply being motivated to something is not a normative state. I can have an urge or a whim or a lust towards something, to use Blackburn's words, and this won't strike me as normative at all. Instead, what we see through the compound states that combine effective attitudes, evaluative attitudes, with the regulation of action tendency, the idea of a fitting representation, of a fitting response to value, or a fitting response to the facts of the world, and therefore these kinds of attitudes give us the possibility of acting through an understanding of the world, an understanding that is both practical and theoretical, and that puts us in a position to be genuinely moral agents. Thank you.